Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to any one of these problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the middle of redoing the problems and we are on page number 284. Please turn to it. Page number 284 and we are at problem number 108. Let's see what it has to say. 108 is a very straightforward problem, problem, uh, straightforward question rather. The question is, what was, what was train's speed when it had reached halfway mark halfway mark of his journey what was the train's speed when it had finished half its journey that's it as, as, as always the question is always straightforward it is the answers that, need to worry, that we need to worry about those are the ones that get a little prickly sometimes let's look at what they tell us in the first statement in the first statement they tell us that 460 miles 460 miles took 4 hours. This is the entire journey. 460 miles is the whole journey. And we are told that it took 4 hours. Well, all we can get out of that one is the average speed over the entire journey. We know that if we travel 460 miles in 4 hours, then 460 divided by 4, 1 and then 15, it must have gone it must have gone at the rate of 115 miles per hour or its average speed over the entire journey must have been 115 miles per hour but there is no way for us to tell from this information what the train's precise speed was when it reached exactly half a mark of its journey this is a worthless information this information is of no use to us step number one statement number one is not just it is not that it is not sufficient it is actually worthless. A D B C E. A D B C E. Now that we established the first statement is of no use to us, we know now answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Now, why is it why is it important to emphasize that this this information that they give us in the first statement is not just not sufficient but worthless? Why is it important to make the distinction between being not sufficient and being worthless? Well, it's a very important distinction because if you establish that this information is worthless then if it turns out the second statement by itself is also not sufficient by itself then there will be no point in wasting our time trying to put the two together because what's the point of putting the information from the two statements together if you already established that the first statement actually provides no useful information so putting it together would be a waste of time it wouldn't get you anywhere so once you establish the second statement by itself is also of no use then the answer would have to be E we wouldn't waste our time putting them together because it's useless information. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that the average speed. Well, what do you know? Average speed. They tell us average speed over the entire journey. Over the entire journey was 115 miles per hour. They are simply repeating. For crying out loud! Says they are simply repeating what they told us in the first statement. And we just established that the information that they gave us in the first statement was utterly worthless, not just not just not sufficient, but utterly worthless. And they go on to repeat the same information in the second statement. It's not going to do anything. The answer is E. They're merely repeating what they said before. The answer is E. Let's go to the next question. There is no way to figure out the precise speed of the train when it reaches exactly half a mark of its journey. There is no way. Based on what they, what is given to us. 108. Let's go, on, let's go on to 109. Problem number 109. 
In 109, we are given a list of numbers. <coughs> in 109, excuse me. In 109, we are given a list. The list looks something like this. 4, 6, all the way up to 22. 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and 22. This is the list that is given to us, but they do not give this list a name. We're going to christen it, we're going to give it a name, we're going to call this list L. We're going to give it a name here so that it's easier for us to refer to it. List L is the list that is given to us. Let's see what they tell us. They tell us that each of the each of each of which is also present in list list. Then they go on to tell us that we have a list M. They go on to tell us that the list M, but list M is not given. We are not given the list of numbers. Uh, in, uh, we are not given the numbers that exist in the list M. They were just told that there exists another list which they are calling M. And we are told that each of which is this this thing, this M consists of consists of eight different integers. Eight different integers. It's very important that we pay attention to to details. They have to be different. We cannot repeat integers. We are told that list M contains eight different integers, each of which appears in the above list. Each of which appears in the above list, list L. Are you with me? Very good. The question simply is, what is the, what is the standard deviation? What is the standard deviation? of list M. Very interesting question. Let's see what they tell us. Shall we? Let's look at the first statement. In the first statement, I don't know why I was so generous with the space here because I left very little room for me to work in. In the first statement they tell us that the two averages, uh, two averages are equal. The average of list L, the average of list L is same as the average of list M. Average of list M. The question is, what is the list average of list L? Can you are you able to tell quickly by looking at the list here without actually doing any work what the average of the list L is? Well, before you answer that question, can you tell me what the average of these three numbers are? Let's say let's say 21, 21, 28, and 35. Can you tell me the average of these three numbers without actually doing any work? One way, of course, is to add up the three numbers and divide the sum by the three. But can you tell just by visual inspection what, what must be the average of these three numbers? Well, the average of these three numbers is exactly 28. The reason why the average of these three numbers is exactly 28 is because they are evenly spaced. Evenly spaced means that the difference from 21 to 28 is 7, and difference from 28 to 35 is also 7. They are evenly spaced. As long as they are evenly spaced, the average has to be the number that falls in the middle. Let's take a look at one more. Can you tell me what the average of these four numbers is? 5, 10, 15 and 20. Can you tell me what the average of these four numbers is? Again, because they are evenly spaced, the average of these four numbers is the number that falls right in the middle. The number that falls right in the middle in this list is the number that falls between 10 and 15. The number that falls exactly between 10 and 12, exactly halfway between 10 and 15, is 12 and a half. Is 12 and a half. That is the average of these four numbers. If you add them up, and you'll find them. You'll see 20 and then this is another 20, 20 plus 20 is 40 and this is 70. 70 divided by 4, 70 divided by 4, 70 divided by 2 would have been 35. But oh, this is not working out. Did I make a mistake? 5, 10, 15 and 20. So 5 plus 15 is 20, 20 plus 20 is 40 and plus 10 is 50. Sorry, not 70. See, this wasn't working out. 70 divided by, 70 divided by 4, 70 divided by 2 is 35 and 35 divided by 2 would have been 17 and a half. I'm showing you here 12 and a half. It's not working out because I made a mistake. It is not 70. It is actually the sum of these four numbers is 50. 5 plus 15 is 20. 20 plus 20 is 40. 40 plus 10 is 50. And 50 plus 4, of course, is 12 and a half because 100, 100 divided by 4 is exactly 25. 
If 100 divided by 4 is 25, then 50 divided by 4 will have to be half of 25, which is 12 and a half. But the point we are trying to make here is that we don't have to do all of this work. The visual inspection tells us that the average of these numbers has to be the number that falls right in the middle because they are evenly spaced. Similarly, these numbers are evenly spaced. These numbers are evenly spaced. Let's find out how many there are. Let's find out how many there are. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There are, there are 10 numbers exactly. There are exactly 10 numbers. There are 5 numbers on this side. There are 5 here. And 5 here. Exactly 10 numbers. Which means the average of these 10 numbers is the number that falls right in the middle of these two numbers. The right in the middle of these two numbers. Four, 12 and 14. The average is 13. The average of the numbers in list L is 13. 13. Which means that the average of the list M also has to be 13. But list M has, keep listing, okay? But list M, we are told, has 8 different numbers. List M, we are told, has 8 different numbers. So that implies, that implies that the sum of the numbers, of the numbers in list M must be 8 times 13. Okay, pay attention and keep listening. 8 times 13. How much is 8 times 13? Well, how the hell do I know? I don't go around memorizing 8 times 13. I know 8 times 10. That I do know. 8 times 10 is 80. I know that. And I know 3 times 8 is 24. 3 eights are 24. 24 plus 80. 24 plus 20 would be... Uh, 12, 80 plus 20 would have been uh, would be 100. It's 104. It's 104. What is the sum of these 10 numbers? Some of the num numbers in list L, there are 10 of them. Listen carefully. There are 10 numbers in list L. L. There are 10 of them and their average is 13. Uh, their, their, their average is 13, which means the sum of the numbers in list L, the sum of the numbers in list L equals 130. It would have to be 130 because there are, there are 10 of them and their average is 13. 13 times 10 is 130. But the sum of the numbers in list M is 104. 104 versus 130, we need to get rid of 26. We have to subtract two numbers. We have to take away two numbers from the list because there are eight of them here. List M has eight numbers. List L has ten numbers. We need to get rid of the two of them such that they add up to 26. We need to get rid of we need to get rid of two numbers. We need to get rid of the two numbers such that they add up to 26. But the question is which two? Let's find out, shall we? We need the room. We need the room big time. Or perhaps we can continue here. Oh, well, it's very simple. Look. Look, I'm going to show you all the three different scenarios and I'm going to flaunt all the different colors that I happen to own. I happen to own, I happen, I happen to be a proud owner of five different colors of markers. Do you understand? And today is my day to flaunt them. Here's the first one. The, their sum has to be 26. We need to get rid of the two numbers such that their sum has to be 26. Here's the first pair. Maybe it is four, maybe it is four, uh, maybe it is four and 22. 4 plus 22 is 26. We can get rid of those two numbers. Or maybe, maybe the two numbers that we need to get rid of is 6 and 20. 6 plus 20 is also 26. Or maybe the two numbers that we need to get rid of is 8 and 18. 8 plus 18 is also 26. Or maybe the two numbers that we need to get rid of is, are 10 and 16. That will also add up to 26. Or oh, finally, maybe the two numbers that we need to get rid of are these two numbers, 12 and 14. If we get rid of 12 and 14, then this will do the job. We need to get rid of two numbers that are add up to 26. But which two? Which pair should we get rid of? Should we get rid of? Should we get, should we get rid of 4 and 22? Or should we get rid of 6 and 20? Or should we get rid of 8 and 18? You get the idea. We don't know. The first statement does not enable us to ascertain which pair should we get rid of. The first statement is not enough. First statement by itself is not enough. It is not a worthless information. It is not a worthless information. It's actually very useful information. It's just not sufficient. It's just not sufficient. Get it? Data sufficiency. A, D, A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. 
Now that we have established that the first statement by itself is not sufficient, we know now, answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. Let's look at second statement. I can put all of these markers away. I was saving them for this particular day. Today was my day. Today was my day, you see, and you always thought that this was going to be boring. This is quite exciting. Four different colors of markers. List statement number two. I need the room. We need the room big time, so I have to erase something here. Remember, list M has eight different numbers. So here is our statement number two. The statement number two says that list M, list M does not have 22. Statement number, statement number two says that the list M, the list that we're looking for, does not contain 22. Now that statement by itself, just the information that is given in that statement by itself, is that enough for us to ascertain what the standard deviation of the numbers that exist in list M is going to be? Of course not. Simply knowing that one particular number does not exist in the list does not tell us the standard deviation of the numbers in the list. Second statement by itself is not sufficient. By itself it is not sufficient. The answer cannot be B. But when we put the two statements together, we are done. We are done because we are trying to figure out which, two, which pair to, to get rid of. What they just told us. They told us that list M does not contain 22. Well, if it does not contain 22, it must also not contain 4. Which means, this means that list M, the 8 numbers that we have in list M are the exact same numbers here. 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and 22. Except, we are just told that it does not contain 22. Well, if it doesn't contain 22, it can not contain 4. Because they have to add up to 26. The two numbers that we need to get rid of have to add up to 26. That's the only way the average of the two numbers, the average of the two lists is going to be the same, equal. That's it, we're done. Now that we know the entries, we know the exact entries, the exact eight entries in list M, obviously we can calculate the standard deviation. The answer is C. Obviously we're not going to say that I actually calculate the standard deviation, not still. That will be, that'll be a waste of time. Let's move on. Number 110. Number 110. Number 110 tells us that Tom, Tom, Jane, and Sue each, each purchased a house. They each bought a house. Good for them. They go on to tell us that the average price was 120k. Average price was 120k. Before we go any further, what do we get out of it? What do we? What can we extract from it? What What we can extract from the fact that the average price was 120,000? And since there are three people, Tom, Jane, and Sue, and they each purchased each person's house to the average price of $120,000, that tells us that the sum must have been 360k. We're going to keep that in mind, okay? It will come in handy. The question is this. What is the median? What is the median of their house, the house prices? Let's see what they tell us, shall we? The first statement tells us that Tom is 110. Well, if Tom is 110, and we just established that the total is 360, if Tom is 110, that implies that Jane plus Susan must equal 360 minus 110, which is 250k. 250k. Must equal 360 minus 110, which is 250, which is 250. So now we know that Jane plus 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 Sue 
the sum total of their value of the two houses is 250k. There are two scenarios we can look at here. There are two possibilities. One possibility is that Jane's house and Susan's house, they are both worth the same amount. They are both worth 125 each. 125 plus 125 would equal 250. In this scenario, in this scenario, the three entries that we, that we have are 110, 110, 125, and 125. Those are the three entries. 125, 125. Question is, what is the median? Well, that's very simple. Median is the middle number right here. That's the median. That is the median. Another possibility is that perhaps, perhaps, perhaps Jane, Jane's house is not worth the same as Susan's house. In which case there are two possible scenarios. Either Jane is more than 125, in which case Susan is going to be less than 125, or Jane is less than 125, Jane's house is worth less than 125, in which case Susan's house has to be more than 125. That's the only way they're going to add up to 250, they have to add up to 250. So here the three entries that we have are, <coughs> here the three entries we have are 110, so, and then something that is less than 125, something less than less than 125, this is how we present it, 125 with a negative sign on top of it, and something that is more than 125. One of, the, one of these two entries, one of these two entries is going to be a Jane, and the other one is going to be Susan. We don't know which one, it doesn't matter. The point here is that, the point here is that in this scenario, it doesn't matter it, what's the median of these three entries. We cannot tell what the median is because we don't know what this, what this number is. Less than 125 could be 105, could be 100, or it could be 120, in which case the median will keep changing. The median will either be 110 or this amount that is, 100, that is less than 125. But that's not the point. The point here is not what is the median of these three numbers. The point here is that the median of these three numbers, the median of these three numbers is not equal to 125. Median of these three numbers is not equal to 125. Here it was 125. So the question is what was the median to which our answer would be? How the hell do we know? It is impossible. The first statement by itself is not sufficient. I left no room for myself at all. Let's put it up here. They each purchased out. Okay, remember. Let's put it up here. A D B C E. A D B C E. Now that we've established the first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer cannot be, or rather is not enough. Now that we've established the first statement by itself is not sufficient, we know that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B. C or E. Let's look at second statement. Let's look at second statement. We need the room. We need to erase all of this thing. Let's look at second statement. I shouldn't have erased uh, this thing in a hurry. I gave you no chance at all to actually have an unobstructed view. I hope you got everything. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that Jane's house is 120. Well, exact same logic as before. If Jane's house is 120, that implies that Tom plus Susan must have been 360 minus 120, which is 240k, which is 240k. The sum of the values of Tom's house and Susan's house has to be 240k. Again, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that both Tom and Susan's, each of their houses were worth 120. Each of their houses were 120, in which case they will add up to 240. Another possibility is that Tom's house is not worth the same as Susan's house. Maybe Tom's house is more expensive than Susan's house, in which case Tom's house will be more than 120,000 because they have to add up to 240. So here, two possibilities is that one guy's per one person's house is more than one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and the other person's house is less than one hundred twenty thousand dollars. It doesn't matter whose house is more expensive. We're not interested in that. It really doesn't matter to us. It really doesn't matter to us. So what this tells us is that there are two scenarios. Maybe Tom's house is more expensive than Susan's, 
or Susan's house is more expensive than Tom, it makes no difference. If this is the case, if this is the case, this implies that Tom, Tom's house is more than 120 and Susan's house is less than 120 or, or Susan's house is more than 120 and Tom's house is less than 120. The point is that if we were to arrange the three entries, we have 120 here, which is which is Jane, which is 120, and then we have one of these two guys, either Susan or Tom, either Susan or Tom, one of these guys whose house is worth less than 120, and the other person's whose house is worth more than 120. So we have three entries. Now we have three entries for sure. We know that the values of the houses of three, these three people are such that one guy's house is worth less than $120,000, the other guy's house is worth more than $120,000, and one guy's house, we are told, is worth exactly $120,000. Well, in which case, the median is 120. Median is 120. So it doesn't matter whether we are dealing with this scenario where both of their houses are worth the same, in which case all three of the people have the houses worth the same amount. 120,000, 120,000, 120,000. The median in this case, of course, because they are all 120,000, the median is in this case is 120,000. Median in this case is 120,000 because it falls right in the middle. So it doesn't matter which scenario we deal with. Second statement definitively tells us that the median price of these three houses must have been $120,000 exactly. $120,000 exactly. Question was, what's the median? Answer is, it's $120,000. Second statement does the job quite nicely. The answer is B. The answer is B. Let's move on then. The very last problem on the page, number 111. I need the break, as always. One hundred and eleven, the very last problem on the page, they tell us that x and y are integers. x and y are integers. The question is, is their product x times y even? Very simple, very straightforward question. As we always know, the questions in these type of, uh, in these areas, in data sufficiency area, typically do tend to be quite straightforward and simple. It is the answer that always get prickly. Let's, let's see what they tell us in the first statement. In the first statement they tell us that x equals y plus 1. x equals y plus 1. I need the room actually so we can have to raise all of this thing. I, I hope it's okay. Not a matter of choice. We have no choice in the matter, you understand? So here we are told that x equals y plus 1. Here, here, here again, there are two possible scenarios we're going to deal with. Very simple scenarios, obviously, since there are two integers x and y, obviously one of them will have to be even, the other one would have to be odd. We'll see why in a second. If x is even, if x is even, if x is even, then y cannot be even, because we are told that x is y plus 1. If x is even, the y would have to be odd, because odd plus a 1 will make it an even number. So if x is even, that implies that y, this implies that y must be odd. y must be odd. And the question is, is their product even? Let's find out. Is their product even? The product of x times y, if x is even, even times the odd, even times the odd, for example, 4 times the 3 is 12, even times an odd is even. The question was, is their product even? The answer turns out, yes it is. If, if x is even, then y has to be odd, y has to be odd, and even times odd is even. Another scenario is just the reverse, which case, y is odd, maybe y is odd. If y is odd, we are told that x is y plus 1. We are told that x is y plus 1. If y is odd, let's say 3 plus 1, that means x must be 4. So that implies that if, if, if y is odd, that implies that x must be even. x must be even. And we have the exact same situation as before. 
the product is going to be even because x times y is same as before even times r except here we have the other way around we have actually we have the same exact thing actually it's the same exact thing even times r even times r is going to be even the answer is yes yes their product is even so it doesn't matter it doesn't matter which one of them is even and which one of them is odd, in both scenarios, their product will always be even. The first statement does the job quite nicely. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is sufficient, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Just look at the second statement. Second statement tells us that second statement tells us that x over y is even. X over y is even. Well, when we talk about a division of one number by the other, one integer by the other, then there are four different scenarios we have to look at, and we're going to look at all four of them, keeping in mind that we have to meet this condition. We have to meet the condition that x divided by y, we are told, is even. Well, first scenario is first scenario is that maybe they are both odd. Is it possible for both of them to be odd? Is it possible for both of them to be odd? For example, 9 over 3. 9 over 3 is 3. Well, 3 is not even. We are told that, uh, that uh, x divided by y is even. This is not even. That tells us that we... Or maybe, maybe, it is, maybe it is something like this. Maybe it is 7 over 3. Maybe it is 7 over 3. They are both odd. 7 over 3. This is not even an integer. Forget about being an even integer. Forget about being an integer. Even integer. It's not even an integer. That tells us that this this this, this scenario does not exist. Let's look at second scenario. Second scenario is that maybe x is odd. Maybe x is odd, and the other one is even. In which case we will have something like nine over two. Again, we can see that this is not even an integer. Forget about being an even integer. Forget about being an even integer. That's not even an integer. So that scenario is not possible. It is not possible. Let's look at third one. The third scenario is that we have maybe even over odd. Even over odd. Let's find out, shall we? Even over odd, for example, 6 divided by 3 is 3. Oh, sorry, 6 divided by 3 would be 2. 6 divided by 3 is 2. Or 12 divided by... even divided by odd or 12 divided or could be 12 divided by 3 in which case it's not even an integer it's not even an integer so that's not possible the only possibility that is left here we did odd odd we did even odd even odd odd even let's look at the last one which is even even which is 12 divided by 2 or 24 divided by 4. It doesn't matter how you do it. It will always be an even number. It will always be uh, the product that is even times even will always be an even number because we are told that x divided by y is even. If it's even, that means one number is divisible by the other, something like this. But the point here is that it has to be Actually, if x divided by y is even, this is also possible. x divided by y here is even. x divided by y is even. So there are these two these two scenarios are possible. Number three is possible. Number three is possible, and so is number four. x divided by y is even. x divided by y is even. Here, x divided by y was not even. Here, x divided by y was not even. We are told that x divided by y is even. Here, x over x divided by y, x divided by y is even. x divided by y is even. Let's find out what the product is going to be here. Even times odd is going to be even. Even times odd is going to be even. X times Y is even. The answer is yes. Or maybe they are both even, in which case even times even is even. Again, the answer is yes. Is their product, is their product even? The answer is yes. Their product is even. Their product is even because there are only two possibilities, which is Either we're dealing with even times even or even times odd. But we do not have these possibilities. We cannot have odd and odd. 
and we, this scenario is not going to work but this is actually futile it's, it's more of a curiosity here because it's not an integer here we are told that it is even so we are talking about something where they are evenly divisible that's all I think I made too much fuss about it in the last question I was losing my concentration you see I'll see you tomorrow okay bye now